Hello, my name is Jackson Burton. I'm the Executive Director of the Quantitative Medicine Program at the Critical Path Institute. And I just want to uh, provide this webinar to share how mass statistics and artificial intelligence can be used in the development of treatments for major diseases. So I'm just gonna go through a little bit about what we're doing and how a lot of these methods play into um, really having some impact in the, the field of pharmaceutical drug development. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm an applied mathematician by training from the University of Arizona. Um, I currently lead the quantitative medicine team here at CPAF, and that really has a lot to do with overseeing how we build quantitative solutions for a lot of different disease areas. Um, we're working in a lot of different um, fields, and we use a lot of different quantitative methods, but most of what I'm going to be sharing today has a lot uh, of credit going to the team, uh, who are just a lot of excellent scientists um, who have really been doing quite a bit. So. Uh, in order to really bridge this gap of how such methods are going to be used for uh, what we're talking about here in drug development, really need to start level setting with some, uh, with some simple things that a lot of you listening probably would be familiar with. So a question for you, uh, do you know anyone with any of these uh, diseases or any of these disorders? My guess is probably yes. Um, Alzheimer's disease is obviously very prevalent as well as Parkinson's. You probably maybe know someone with type 1 diabetes or probably type 2 diabetes. Um, perhaps you know someone, a family member or a friend who has a rare disease, such as Duchenne muscular dystrophy, polycystic kidney disease, or, or maybe an ataxia. Um, you may know somebody who has a newborn in the neonatal intensive care unit. And the reason I'm highlighting these specific ones as well, it's because we work in these disease uh, areas, and they really have a common theme to them which is that they represent uh, unmet medical needs. And so what we mean by that is that there are not very good treatments out there to help these uh, different diseases and disorders. And so they represent um, challenges uh, within the drug development space for how to actually make treatments. And so to really understand how all these methods I'm gonna talk about actually can help advance treatments, we first have to really understand how are treatments actually designed and tested? Well, it actually occurs in a lot of different phases, and it is quite a long and expensive process. There's a phase called the preclinical, where drugs are actually kind of developed in a lab, and then once approved by uh, regulatory agencies like FDA or EMA, they go into testing in humans. The first phase really has to do with testing to make sure the drug is actually safe and effective. Then, if that uh, reaches that milestone, the drug will then advance to phase two, where it will be tested to see if it can show some actual effect and improvement in the disease. If that shows to be true, it will move to phase three, where we call this kind of a large pivotal study. A lot of different people enrolled, uh, very diverse groups, and what that aims to do is really solidify that the treatment is effective and safe, and that's when it would get submitted for approval. Now, the question is, uh, that seems like a pretty straightforward process, but why is that actually so hard? Well, there are a lot of challenges in designing a phase three clinical trial um, to really bring new treatments through. Believe it or not, and this is surprising to people, it can actually be quite difficult to know if someone has the disease. For example, in Alzheimer's disease, the only conf confirmation that a person has it is an autopsy of the brain after the person has passed away. Um, Diseases can also be very rare, making it difficult to actually enroll enough participants. Um, and testing treatments for some diseases may require events like death or a new disease stage to occur, and that may take much longer than the duration of the trial, and that makes it difficult to actually see if the treatment was effective. Even in one disease, the variability of how that disease progresses can actually be quite high. And that may make it very difficult to measure. And if it's difficult to measure, it's also difficult to identify if the treatment is effective or not. And lastly, and probably most importantly, when treatments are designed and eventually brought to the market, they really need to affect how a patient feels, functions, or survives. In order for that to happen, the patient's perspective on the most troubling or disabling aspects of the disease really need to be included from the start. 
And that can actually be difficult to quantify uh, the voice of the patient in drug development, but it's a real central focus, especially of FDA and EMA uh, nowadays. But what all of these different challenges have in common is really comes down to when you consider a population of individuals, you may be able to understand who has a disease or who doesn't, or who is going to enter your trial and who isn't. But even when you put those people in your trial, you still end up with a lot of heterogeneity within that patient group. And so what really needs to happen is that there has to be um, a focus on quantifying uncertainty. And that really has a lot to do with where the quantitative medicine program comes into play. So the quantitative medicine program at CPATH really has a central mission of creating solutions for drug development through what we call model informed drug development or MIDD. Now, MIDD has three main aspects to it that kind of intersect for which MIDD is focused on. First and foremost, you have to have a good scientific knowledge of the disease, both how it progresses, how it's measured with clinical outcomes, or biomarkers, ways of measuring the disease in people so that you can actually gain understanding about it. With that knowledge, you then also need uh, a strong quantitative um, kind of toolbox, so to speak. Basically, the different methods out there, uh, quantitative methods that would actually enable you to build solutions uh, for these different um, drug development challenges. These might include uh, methods like math and statistics or something called pharmacometrics, which I'll describe uh, later on. Uh, AI and machine learning, which most of you have probably heard as it's often in the news. And then uh, something called digital data analytics, um, which really helps us understand how to analyze data coming from wearable devices or mobile devices like smartphones or smartwatches. And lastly, and most importantly, you need data. Uh, data is the foundation to build all of these solutions on. And the data that we at CPATH really look to acquire is patient level, meaning the individual's patient's records that help us inform how to build these tools with this knowledge. We have a number of different uh, disease areas that we support in the quantitative medicine program shown here on the edges of this diagram. Um, and these really happen in partnership with our consortia. A cons the consortia we have here by these acronyms are really public-private partnerships to help uh, bring together a lot of different stakeholders like pharmaceutical companies or disease foundations or researchers or the regulatory agencies into a centralized place where we can share data and knowledge. The question is, how do we actually build these tools? Uh, what goes into this process? Well, we like to think of it in a reverse engineering way. So we like to think, what is the tool that would be most useful for, say, a pharmaceutical company to develop a phase three clinical trial? So for example, we might envision something like a fully functioning user tool, like an app that actually helps you simulate a trial or predict a trial outcome or ask other questions. So if we think about that with the uh, end in mind, we can then backtrack and say, well, what are the quantitative methods that would actually be used to build that? But in order to understand what the methods are, um, we really need to understand the data and how that data can be used to build those models and those algorithms. The data, really importantly, needs to be standardized, it needs to be integrated, it needs to be curated, and it needs to be patient level. This type of putting, all, uh, putting this type of data together in one source is a really critical aspect uh, as the foundation for all that we do. And that aspect represents probably the most difficult uh, part of this whole process. In order to actually get data to that level, what we really need is a legal infrastructure to help uh, bridge that gap and build such databases. So this comes in the form of data contribution agreements. These are legal agreements that uh, are actually executed with various uh, partners that we have for which their data can be contributed in a safe and secure manner and which we will use it to build a particular tool. The only way that we can have the legal infrastructure to really uh, drive this process forward is to have pre-competitive collaboration, which is at the core of CPAS vision and mission. 
being a neutral convener to bring a lot of diverse, com even competitive stakeholders together, but in a pre-competitive sense. And so when we envision this process, we really then go and execute in this direction. So what is it that we actually do? Uh, so I'm gonna show kind of uh, more or less a blitz of the various projects that we have going on uh, with the goal of giving a flavor of how a lot of these tools uh, are being developed based on a lot of the quantitative methods uh, that I've already described. The first one I'd like to discuss is pharmacometrics. So as I alluded to before, uh, pharmacometrics is a discipline in the pharmaceutical sciences, really makes use of mathematical models of biology, pharmacology, and disease to actually answer questions about the drug development process. Now these models are often built on existing data, and you can answer a lot of different questions with them. Um, but for us, we're really focused on how to improve clinical trial design especially for those phase three studies, which we know are so hard to design. So at CPATH, uh, we have several applications of these models kind of being used primarily to build clinical trial simulation tools. And what is a clinical trial simulation tool? Well, it's really a tool that lets you simulate the outcome of a potentially real trial. And why this is so useful is that it lets us test a lot of different design options for your trial especially about which patients you should enroll, how many, how long the trial should be, should there be any biomarkers that you can account for to help improve the trial outcome, things like that. And when we think about these tools, uh, we really need to uh, focus it on those MIDD concepts that I said. So particularly, what are we doing? Well, uh, in Alzheimer's disease within our CPAD consortium, we've actually completed the development of a clinical trial simulation tool, which you can see here, that allows you to test for the outcome of a trial to see if a potential treatment would actually be effective. We're doing the same thing in Parkinson's disease, and what I'm showing here are actually some of the under the hood or nuts and bolts of what actually goes on behind the scenes of some of these tools. And we're in the late stages of completing uh, a clinical trial simulation tool there. We're doing the same thing in Huntington's disease. Um, and again, here's some of the data and some of the underlying kind of quantitative methods that are under the hood. We're also doing this in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which is a rare disease. And this is also nearing completion. Um, and here you can see the example of, of kind of a web app that helps you uh, simulate out clinical trials. We're also getting into uh, rare diseases through our Rare Disease Cures Accelerator, um, which is an entire initiative. But within that, uh, one disease area we're looking at is Frederick's ataxia. And here in the early stages, we're just kind of get a sense of what the data is, you know, as one of those buckets of the uh, MIDD principles to help inform what tools we're going to select and then what, um, or what models we're going to select and then what tools we're going to build. So another area that we uh, work a lot in is a kind of mathematical and statistical modeling, which does have overlap with pharmacometrics, but has some distinct features. So these are really uh, used to analyze a, different, a lot of different problems in drug development. Um, one main method we often use these is really to predict, predict an event occurring, such as say a type one diabetes diagnosis, or say when a kidney transplant may fail. So a lot of the uh, modeling that we do here are really designed to address a lot of these challenges um, for clinical trial design that uh, come for some of these diseases. So we're currently using these um, really about enrichment, patient enrichment, which means who should enter a trial and who shouldn't. Uh, we're also analyzing um, methods to build a scoring system to assess uh, when an event's going to occur like a kidney failing after a transplant. Um, we've also used methods in the past to identify which drugs are actually effective at killing the tuberculosis bacterium. So uh, just as a snapshot, in type 1 diabetes, we've uh, developed quite a bit of work that actually predicts when a person would get diagnosed with type 1 diabetes based on a lot of different features that they may have. Uh, including biomarkers, their blood glucose, you know, their age, whether they're male or female. And I'm um, showing here that this nice red line uh, is a really good predictive model for the black line, which is the data. 
similarly, we're also doing things in a rare disease called polycystic kidney disease, where we're assessing how uh, end-stage renal disease may actually occur um, based on various things like how, what the volume of your actual kidney is, uh, what some other biomarkers are that would uh, be indicative of when your kidneys would fail, uh, and so forth. Uh, also in Parkinson's, we're switching gears, and we've actually been working on a method that actually tests how accurate the tests are to measure Parkinson's disease. So as an example, this gives us an idea of how good the outcome measures are that, say, a clinician would administer to a patient. And getting an understanding of this helps us to optimize what tests we would actually use to measure disease. In kidney transplant, within our uh, transplant therapeutics consortium, we're building uh, a tool that allows us to create a score after just one year from a tr kidney transplant to predict what the probability is of that uh, kidney failing after five years, uh, which uh, takes a lot of collaboration and a lot of effort. And lastly, some previous work that we've done was in tuberculosis, where we actually can use mathematical models. And we've built these models to actually predict when uh, a certain tuberculosis drug would actually kill bacteria and in what dosage and in what frequency. So moving on, uh, we're also working a lot in artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, you've probably heard about a lot of things like this in the news since artificial intelligence is becoming very popular and has a lot of different areas uh, of use. At the core, AI and machine learning, which is a type of AI, is really used to detect patterns in data, especially complex data and large volumes of data. So in the pharmaceutical drug development world, it's really being used in a number of different areas, but most notably, uh, it's being used to analyze MRI images, it can read large volumes of health records, uh, and it can pr predict future outcomes such as dangerously low blood sugar. So some of the ways we're using it is to analyze MRI images uh, from Alzheimer's disease patients to understand how fast they'll progress. Uh, we're also analyzing if certain drugs developed for a disease could be used uh, to treat a different disease, specifically in the infectious disease space. We're also beginning to look at neonatal data to improve care and develop treatments for neonates with disorders. So specifically here is just a, a an new progress coming with Alzheimer's disease where we're uh, developing uh, methods to automate the analysis of these very complex MRI images. And that happens with something called deep learning, which you may have heard of, and really goes through a, a pretty systematic algorithmic process to generate outcomes uh, from the, the patterns it recognizes in the data. Um, specifically with infectious diseases, we have uh, an effort going on where um, data that is being collected by clinicians is getting centralized and used uh, to then analyze um, for patterns in that data. This is happening through something called natural language processing, which allows basically a computer to learn language and extract meaningful information out of it. In this case, understanding how some drugs uh, may be effective for different types of infectious diseases. And a new effort for us is really in the neonatal space within our International Neonatal Consortium. And really, this is a process by which we're gonna execute where we're gonna take in data, curate it, and we're gonna to start to ask them very specific questions and then employ some specific methods uh, such as natural language processing or other machine learning uh, approaches to really generate some of these tools that we've talked about. Uh, lastly, an area that we're in is something that I have called digital data analytics. And this is really a new and emerging field that has gaining a lot of popularity in pharmaceutical drug development. It has to do with utilizing technology in the form of wearable and remote devices for which those devices can provide uh, sensitive measures uh, to various things, such as um, movement, like walking or sleep, or, or maybe a continuous glucose monitor, which has uh, been around for quite some time. But the data from these devices is, is very dense, uh, and it takes a lot of quantitative machinery, so to speak, to actually make use of that data. The one thing we're, uh, a couple things we're doing uh, right now is we're actually working on developing algorithms to analyze data from accelerometers 
quantify disease progression and movement disorders. And this is occurring through Parkinson's disease uh, within our CPP consortium. And another area we're working on is really to understand the relationship between um, continuous glucose monitors uh, and establish outcomes in type 1 diabetes. So what does this look like? Well, in Parkinson's, as I was just alluding to, things like a smartwatch actually produce quite a bit of data from the accelerometers contained in the watch. And that data, after doing some appropriate mathematics and uh, transformations of that data, can then be used to get a, a raw signal shown here in the lower right that actually detects, say, steps or, you know, your gait patterns or maybe your sleep patterns. And then understanding these can then be used for patients, uh, say, in Parkinson's disease to maybe better assess how the disease is progression and then ultimately to maybe use those in clinical trials for uh, developing new treatments. In type 1 diabetes uh, with continuous glucose monitors, these monitors produce quite a bit of data um, as to what your blood glucose is over time. And there are a lot of different statistics, mathematics, and other types of approaches that can be used to quantify uh, different metrics that come from this, this data. And those are being currently used uh, within CPAP to establish a link between the blood glucose levels and really important events like hypoglycemia or very low blood sugar, which can lead to a hospitalization or other um, dangerous events. So in summary, uh, I hope that gives you a snapshot of some of the things that we're doing. Um, I just, just to summer, summarize, the quantitative medicine program at CPATH is really aimed at building solutions to help improve pharmaceutical drug development using these various quantitative approaches. And one thing I really didn't highlight is that the solutions that we build really have a lot of input from not only external stakeholders like pharmaceutical companies, disease foundations, uh, other researchers who are experts, but also the regulatory agencies. And the purpose of bringing in the regulatory agencies into the discussions is really so that they can review these tools and that they can endorse them to help ensure confidence for different companies or researchers to use them. And we want to make sure that these tools are practical, that they're adoptable, and that they're directly translatable to immediate impact. But all of this can only happen through collaboration, uh, and CPATH is very focused on open science, and our neutral can, uh, status uh, allows us to bring together a very diverse group of stakeholders. So it's really where CPATH thrives uh, in building that type of pre-competitive collaboration to build these solutions. So I just want to close. Uh, one item that I did not mention in my opening bio is that I used to be a mathematics teacher for high school. And the amount of times that I got the phrase, when will I ever use dot, 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 uh, came up quite a bit. And that came in the form of math. I decided to do a Google search, and these were the first hits that came up in Google. So clearly, most of the known world is asking these questions about when will I ever use you know, math or statistics or any of these things. Well, I guess my statement is, how about now? So I want to conclude there, and I just want to thank um, and acknowledge the support of the Flynn Foundation and, and the FDA for this, and AZ Bio um, for helping us to have this webinar. So thank you, and have a good day.